I'd like to be able to continue this at least through the month of March. Mm -hmm. At least through the month of March, all right? Uh, I might take another vote at, towards the end of March and see where we're at at that point. Uh, I personally, I mean, if it, it is up to me, I guess, but we are also a democratic uh, local church. So I am okay with finding out where everybody's at and then going accordingly and making the final decision. If it were my way, we'd do this all year long. I like the, yes, I, do. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I like the, I, I like the, uh, Amen. I, 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 mean, I, I wish more would stay for the entire thing. I wish more would stay for the afternoon service because I think you're missing out by not being here. You don't have to drive back. You shouldn't have any evening obligations. But I, I personally like this format uh, much better. I'd like to build into it at some point if the Lord allows an opportunity in the afternoon to also maybe hit some houses or even go out to the street and hold signs, something like that. Um, but let's continue this at least through the month of March. Now that means that puts a lot of work in, on, on my mom and on Steve. So if you can help in any way, see them and find out what can I do to help so you don't have to take all of this upon yourself. Right. All right. So um, I know you're already doing that, but continue doing that. Yes, ma'am. Can we just make a potluck? Nobody has the responsibility. I'm, I'm fine with that, too. I just want to make sure there's food here. <laughs> so if you sign up for something, make sure you bring it. Right? right? Or bring something anyways. Or make sure you're here with something anyways. I'll bring crackers. Hey, amen. <laughs> amen. But uh, so we can certainly talk about that. Um, yeah. You know, I guess you probably leave that up to you to kind of coordinate that. But um, <clears throat> let's continue that. Now, I had talked about having a sunrise service in... For, uh, for Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, whatever you, whatever you like to call it. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do the sunrise service. I'm going to hold to the regular service hours on that day, and that's where we'll, that's where we'll go with that, okay? So it'll be regular 9.30, 10.30, uh, 2 o'clock service with dinner on the grounds in between all that, okay? Is there anything I'm missing? Yes. Is it what you and I talked about for the 14th? Mm. In March, in March 14th, yeah. it'll be four years. March 11th, I think it is, that Pastor uh, took over the church and we became Liberty Bible Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And I just like to do something a little special on that day. Amen. So, and then, and then, when, as I mentioned at the Jeff and asked him him about it, then he's like, you know, actually, I'd like to keep up the, the daily mm -hmm. you know, the sure. Sunday right. fellowship things right. in general. Right. So I guess we'll just tie it all in. Amen. Yeah, it'll be four years but, uh, in uh, four years in March. If I could. Oops. At some point this afternoon, uh, Todd, Gary, and Steve Kessler, if we could just get together, I got a, something I'd like to mention. Sure. He asked me if that was okay, and I said yes. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll plan on that. Amen. Is there anything else I'm missing? Like I said, I know we've got folks out today. If you don't see them, keep them in prayer. Um, am I missing anything? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not just anything, but just you know, keep the people in Texas in prayer. Yes, sir. There's a lot of people hurting right yeah, now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, tough, tough times ahead. No grid. No, sir. That's right. Oh, I, on that note, um, you guys might remember Heidi. She's the one that actually yeah. recommended Pastor Cross. Yes. Karen keeps in touch with her. You know, her sons come here. She's yes. been without power and water, too. Okay, so keep Heidi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think her name is Heidi Schnell in Prayer. Yeah, her son comes home sometimes. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, all right, and then uh, all the other prayer requests uh, that are already there, keep that up. Yes? Just having a thing. Time gets away from us. Happy spiritual birthday today. Oh, 40 years and then two days. 40 years today, Dad, has been, has been in the family of God. Amen. 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 Born again. All right, well, if, there, if there is nothing else, then let's stand and sing. And on this, if you have an offering, if you have an offering on this, you can put it in the basket. If you have change, put it in the ammo box. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. On the first, who we have heard, sound, Jesus is.
Because Satan reminds me of days I left behind. But I look deep into the scriptures. Right. That's where I yeah, find I Jesus buried my past. Yeah, amen. In the middle of God's nowhere is where it was cast. Mm -hmm. Sins forgiven, bound for heaven, mm -hmm. Jesus set me free mm -hmm. at last. Mm -hmm. On the cross he cried, it's finished, and Jesus buried my past. Amen. When the world has come against you and life gets you down, the sins of your old life keep hanging around. Mm. Oh, but don't give up praying or standing your ground. Cause in the midst of my own battles, that's where I found. Jesus buried my past. Amen. In the middle of God's nowhere is where it was cast. Amen. Sins forgiven, bound for heaven. Amen. Jesus set me free at last. Amen. On the cross he cried, it's finished. And Jesus buried my past. Amen. 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 Very good. Bless you, Lord. All right, children, be dismissed. Let's stand one more time for the reading of God's Word this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Amen. I appreciate the, the melody there, the tune, but also the words. It's good to be able to sing it and know it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right. Second Corinthians chapter one. Second Corinthians chapter one. I kind of knew on I guess Sunday last week, but I was gonna preach this week unless the Lord was gonna change it. And I saw that maybe he would, but he did. And of course, uh, you know, we had kind of an unusual service last week with uh, that lady Blaine. Having lost her baby at childbirth, and that kind of broke the service. Yeah. Um, so the Lord had laid this on my heart, I guess, at that time. And of course, uh, you know, things happened throughout the course of this past week that I guess cemented the idea of being grounded and settled, and this is what needed to be preached. In fact, I don't normally tell people what I'm about to preach, but I did talk to a couple of the guys in church this week and told them I was going to preach on uh, this topic. And, uh, as I said, sometimes you wish the ones that you know need it, but they're just not here to hear it. And so you think, well, Lord, am I, is it me or is it you? <laughs> and uh, I hope that whoever needs this sermon today will get the help. Or perhaps you're fixing to go into something and you're going to need this sermon on the back of your mind. Or perhaps you know someone that, need this, that needs this sermon. You can give them at least one or two verses out from this sermon. Amen. Amen? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll read two verses and then you may be seated. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Aren't you thankful for God's mercy this morning? Amen. And the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulations. Aren't you thankful it says all there? Yeah. And not some yeah. or many or a few. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I want to preach to you this morning a sermon on just that word there, comfort. Comfort. Brother Dave Jr., would you pray for us this morning? <clears throat> All the blessings that are ours. Father, Amen. Lord, you're faithful to give us all the time. Pray help us to be more mindful of these things. Amen. Pray, Lord, you just be with the preacher now. Lord, I pray to speak to each and every one of our hearts. We know you're not a God far off, but you're a God at hand. Yes. Lord, you're even in this room now, moving Thank as you see fit, doing what you please with all of our hearts. I pray you help each and every one of us not to limit you. Yes. Lord, to be stiff-necked or hard-hearted, but to be sensitive to you and what you're trying to communicate to us. 
Hey, we thank you for what you do today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I do appreciate the hymns that we sang about Jesus saves, and to God be the glory. And uh, the other one there, which really does go to the theme and the heart of this message here, because how can you have comfort without the one who does the comfort first and foremost? The Bible said there that God, the Father of all mercies, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the one that comforteth us in all our tribulation. And what a blessing it is to know that we serve a living Savior who is in the world today. I know that He is living whatever end may, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. And what a blessing that you can see God's hand in your life. See God's hand of protection. See God's hand of deliverance. But more than that, you see God's hand of comfort. God's hand is a very comforting hand. God's presence is a very comforting presence, if you know it. If you know it. And so I want to preach on comfort here this morning. Read, a, read just the opening here as I lay it out, as the Lord laid it out of my heart. Since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, mankind has been experiencing death, sorrow, grief, pain, tears, and loss. That is the fate of all mankind. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says for an Adam we all die. The Bible says is a point unto man wants to die. The Bible says wherefore by one man sin, uh, wherefore by one man sin, death came into the world. So death passed upon all men for that all have sin. Uh, Genesis chapter 5 it says, this fellow lived such and such years, and he died. This fellow lived such and such years, and he died. The oldest man in the Bible, Methuselah, lived 969 years, and he died. The way of all, uh, David said uh, to his son Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. The way of all the earth is death. Yeah, yeah. That is the way of all the earth. Uh, the Bible says there that uh, David, uh, he fell asleep. He went to sleep, and that's what death is like. It's like going to sleep. And the reason why death is like going to sleep, especially for the Christian, is because one day he's going to wake up. And David says, when I awake, I shall see thy face. He says, and I will be like thy likeness, is what he Amen. said there. And David knew that he was taking a cat nap. David knew that while he was going to sleep, he was going to wake again. And when he awoke, the Bible says that when the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, it says the graves were open. The souls that slept awoke and came out of the graves. Amen. The born again Christian, one that knows that he's going to heaven, he just passes from this life and he goes into the next. What a thing. But that's the fate of all mankind. With death comes sorrow. With sorrow comes great grief. With great grief comes great pain, emotional pain, physical pain. With pain comes tears. And this all equals out to be just one big loss. One big loss. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. <laughs> Consider that the real first family, you know we say the president family is the first family, but the real first family was Adam and Eve. That's the real first family. They experienced the first loss of a child anywhere in the Bible. The first family suffered the first loss of a child in Abel. But they lost Abel, their first child, through the murder of his brother, their other son, Cain. That is the first family who lost the first child that was ever born into this world. That child's life was snuffed out short by the hand of their other child, by the hand of the brother of Abel, whose name was Cain. You think that in your family you've suffered great loss and pain and sorrow and death, and I know you'll have, but imagine that you're the first ever woman in the world to bring forth the first ever child into the world, and that child turned out to be a murderer who killed your other son. You want to talk about death and sorrow. Imagine coping with that. See, I want you to minimize my grief. I'm not trying to minimize your grief, but I am trying to maximize the truth that the entire world from the fall of Adam and Eve has been nothing but hospitals and graveyards, friends. Right, yeah, yeah. Hospitals and graveyards. 
My kids marvel at all the, every time we go and visit you guys, at all the graveyards that are there. All the gravestones, you know, and how, how many there are. Well, as long as there's life, there's going to be death. That's the way the thing works. I don't believe that man is born a sinner, but I believe that man is born in the image of Adam. That is, that man is born to die. Now, no child that comes to this world is born a sinner. Because a child, when he dies, goes to heaven. And no sinner gets into heaven. Right. So a child isn't, that's born or prematurely or dies at childbirth or dies in the womb, that, that child is not a sinner. It is made in the image of Adam in that in Adam we all die. It doesn't become a sinner until it recognizes the law and breaks it on purpose and is disobedient to the law of God. Now that person, Amen. that that once that child, that baby what that once was, is now a sinner on its way to hell. But until that time, you're just simply not guaranteed to live. Right. Because that's the fate of Adam. As it was the fate of Abel. Not only did Cain kill Abel, but then, if that wasn't bad enough, Cain becomes an outcast and a vagabond. Think about this for a second. Your child kills your other child. Now you've got one child left. And as a mother, uh, you, you watch those you know, crime stories and the mother's always advocating on the behalf of the child that has been accused and has been convicted, is even locked up. She's still, that's her baby. That's her, that's her child. That's the fruit of her womb. That's the... That's what she gave life to, and that's what she raised, and that's what she nurtured and cared for and loved, and she's a good mother. And even in all that, that mother still has a, a connection, even more than the father does. I mean, the father's connected, but that mother has a, she, she carried it for nine months in the womb. She's closest to that thing that ever could be. Yeah. Even that child being accused of murder and behind bars, that's still her baby. But Cain, by the will and power and judgment of God, drives Cain out from his mother's presence. Yeah. He's driven out to be an outcast and a vagabond. Once he's gone, she never sees him again. So the Bible at least doesn't record that, if she did. It's not like when, uh, when uh, uh, Rachel there, uh, not Rachel, is it Rachel? Somebody help me out here, I'm preaching. When, uh, when Jacob and Esau, uh, is, it, is it Rachel? No, it's not Rachel. Re 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 no, Rebecca had Isaac. Isaac married. Yeah, it's Rachel. No, is it? Oh, my goodness. Some help with my own preaching sermon here. Whatever it is, Jacob and Esau, I think a visitor says, well, he don't know what he's talking about. That's true. That's very true. I have no idea what he's talking about. That's why I tend to stick to the Bible. But I'm going outside and trying to go somewhere where I hadn't even planned. Jacob and Esau. Remember, Jacob steals Esau's birthright. You remember that there? Well, what happens? It is Rebecca. What happens? Rebecca, she tells uh, 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 Jacob, you know, you've got to go. You've got to run and hide. She sends him away. But eventually, you know, Esau and Jacob come back together. But Jacob doesn't come back to see his mother at her death. She doesn't, he doesn't get to be there at her burial. What a sad thing. That is that not every mother gets to be reunited with her children. You want to talk about sorrow and grief and loss and pain. She had to kick her own son out because she knew that he was certainly going to die. And she never got to see him again before she died. Mm -hmm. To know what a mother goes through and all that, you just can't. You can't understand it. You can't, you can't recognize it. Yet the Bible speaks so often about it. Think about David. I thought about this. You know what the Bible never really reveals is any death in the womb. You look at that entire Bible, you can't find one time where somebody dies in the womb that God magnifies it. There's some things that are so private, so intimate, that they shouldn't be put out for public consumption. Right. It's really a personal thing. A lot of death outside the womb. Yeah. Remember David's son, he's seven days old, and he dies. Wow. Seven days, imagine having that. Bathsheba bears a son through uh, David's sin of adultery, they're killing Uriah. As a result, his, first, his child through Bathsheba, the first one they have, he died at seven days old. That's, that's about as close as it gets to being still in the womb. There's never any mention of somebody losing life in the womb. There's some things that just should not be put out there for the public to consume because not even God deals with that. Why? Because it's a sorrowful thing. It's a very grieving thing. It's a very personal thing. 
Death is a very personal thing. You say, well, how is there any comfort in that? You know what God did for Eve? He gave her another son. His name was Seth. Amen. And the Bible said that in Seth's lifetime, in Seth, people began to call upon the Lord. The Lord yeah. Amen. I want you to think about it for a second. When God told Eve that she would uh, have a son, He said, I'll put enmity between thy seed and her seed. She thought when she had Cain, that would be the one. It wasn't. She thought that Abel would be the one. He wasn't. It was Seth that was going to be her seed. Seth was the man child promised to Eve that she didn't know at the time where she lost Cain and lost Abel. That is that God built in a source of comfort for her that wasn't readily or immediately known. It was Seth. I guess they call that next child that uh, when it comes to losing a child, the next child to come after the one that's lost is the rainbow baby. Well, Seth ain't the rainbow baby. Noah's the rainbow baby. Yeah. Noah's far down the line. But you know how Noah got there? Through Seth. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Seth is kind of like the rainbow baby. Mm -hmm. He's there to give way. And then through Seth, and that whole lineage there, you know who comes out? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That is that God built in a source of comfort for the loss and the pain and the grief of having lost two children, one to death and one to being an outcast. You know where you find your source of comfort? In the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. He is the promised seed. He is the promised one. He is the man child that was promised in Genesis that would come that in first or second Corinthians chapter one, verses three and four, that is said to be the God of all comfort. That Seth. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of all comfort. He was the comfort to Eve when she had no children, and he's the comfort to you when you've lost children or lost anybody or dealing with any grief or sorrow at all. He's still the only one that can truly give the comfort that you need. Amen. You see, God's comfort is unlike man's comfort. You know, man can try to comfort the best way he knows how. But in reality, he doesn't know you the way that God knows you. Amen. Right. I can only, you can only comfort to a point to bring you to Christ. But for the rest of the time, it's Christ Jesus. That's right. And, and really, man is not your best source of comfort. In fact, man will do more to hurt you. The fact, in fact, the ones that are supposed to love and care and protect you are the ones the Bible says are going to do you the most harm. In Psalm 27, verse 10, the Bible says this, When my mother, or my, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. That is that even if a mother has no love for her child, whether she kills the child in the womb or chooses to give it up for adoption, when the mother and the father decide, I cannot and I will not care for this life, you know what God says? I got you. You know, sin will do sin. It'll take you so far away from family and friends. But God's always there. That's right. Amen. That part of the son was driven out of his home by the, the lust and the greed of life. The Lord Jesus Christ never left his side the whole way through. That's right. And he was right there waiting for him when he came running back with arms wide open. Amen. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. That's right. Nobody else can. Amen. What a comfort. What a promise we have. It's not until the Lord Jesus Christ returns to catch his bride away and establishes a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness and wherein all the curses that are found uh, by the sin of Adam and Eve there, all the curse will be lifted. Until that time, we'll have to go through this life knowing that eventually we will all deal with uncertain times and difficult storms. As I said, I know there are some that have either just come out of a storm. There are some that are in a storm right now and you're fixing to go into one. Yeah. You are somewhere within all that. Mm -hmm. You have either left one in Texas or you're fixing to hit one up here. Yeah. Or you're just in the middle waiting on both sides. Mm. You know what you need to have? You know what you do have the whole way through is God. Amen. It's God. 
Also, I want this with Rebecca. As I said, I get all my sermons, you know, from my wife, and she she writes it all down for me, and, and uh, she just can't preach as good as I do. So we preach to each other at home. Amen. I've used that joke before, but you still laugh at it. I appreciate that. Amen. But I was telling her this. I said, "Listen, honey. I said, from the cradle to the grave, God is with you." Amen. I mean, he's there in the womb. I know that. But from the cradle to the grave, God is with you. There's not a time where God has ever, you've ever escaped God's sight. Amen. Even as an unsaved person that doesn't know Christ, the Bible says that he's always there. His ear is always open. He, he's attentive unto their cry. He's willing to save all that have come to him but for salvation. Yeah. Now the intimate relationship that he has in you because you are saved is unique and like no other relationship on earth Amen. or even in heaven. But the truth is, from the time you come into this world until the time you leave it, God is always there. His comfort is always made available to you and I. Amen. God, you know what God does in the Bible? You ever wonder how God uses storms time and time again? Mm -hmm. The Bible, again, Noah's flood. What is that? It's a storm. I mean, it's a really bad one, but it's a storm. Mm -hmm. Throughout the Bible, there are storm after storm. Even uh, with Elijah there, uh, there's a storm that comes. He sees the hand of God uh, in the cloud there, and all of a sudden it begins to rain. A storm came down. Storms are all throughout the Bible. When the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, and he's, what does he do? One time he's, he's walking on the midst of the on top of the water there, in the midst of a storm. Another time he's in the ship, and the waves are all about, the waves are pouring in, the, the ship is filled with water, they're going down in the water, and Jesus Christ is asleep in the storm. Yeah. Another time, Paul's on a great storm, the storm of Euryclidon, on his way uh, over to Rome there. A great storm comes up, so I said it breaks apart the ships. Paul says, I've been in the, in the deep in the nights and all that kind of stuff. Storms are all throughout the Bible. Yeah. You know what storms are? Storms are God's way of cleaning things up. Yeah. Yeah. Storms are God's spiritual way of cleansing. Think about it, Noah's time. What did it do? What did God do? Yeah. If you believe the Noah's, if you believe the, the, the Noah flood account, if you don't, then I can't help you. But if you believe it, God drowned out the entire earth, all the world there. Universal flood. Not a local Amen. flood. Universal. Only eight people were saved. Yeah. Not because God didn't want to save more, just only eight chose to get on the ark. Amen. I mean, you're not cattle. God ain't gonna drag you on his ship. Like Noah did with those those animals there. You got to get on the ship by your free will. God yeah. gave that to you. Right. He's got to exercise yeah. it. But God cleansed the land is what He did yeah. because of all the sin that was in the world, and He began a, a a new family, the family of Noah there, and they would bring about the next lineage there. But God's the storms that came through the Bible, they're there for cleansing. The stone that you read about Jesus Christ going through, what did it do? It always worked on the faith of his disciples. Amen. Peter, wherefore didst thou doubt? Mm. Lord, save me. God went across the ocean there to get to the, the, the Gadarenes to save a man. God's storms are for cleansing. What am I saying? I'm saying that you're going to have to go through storms in your life to do some serious cleansing in your life. That's right. Yeah. You've got too much stuff built up between you and God, Amen. and God needs to come in and, and say, you ready to talk? There's nothing else in your way now. Amen. Storms, have you ever flushed the toilet? I hope so. <laughs> what does that do? It cleanses the toilet bowl. God's storms is a big, giant flush. You think a, a meteorologist, a guy that studies hurricanes, he said that's what a hurricane does. A, a hurricane comes in the process of a hurricane, it gets everything, all the trash and all the debris in the ocean, and it cleanses it out. That's what God does with you and I. He flushes the trash in our life, the refuse, the, 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 the muck and the mire, the filth in our life. God flushes it. Amen. And he says, we're back to square one. That's right. Let's go. See, I don't like storms. I don't like storms either. I'm not much of a fan of them. So I want to preach on four ways, four holy ways, a Christian can receive comfort during a storm or time of sorrow or during a time of trial. 
Let's go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John 14. Four ways for a Christian to receive comfort. I think if you're going to go through storms, you might want to know the way to be comforted in the midst of it. I didn't say that God would take the storm away. I didn't say He would not have storms. I'm saying, how do you get comfort while you are in the storm? You say, I'm not in a storm, but you're going to be. Yeah. Or, I passed, or I just came out of a great storm. How'd you come out of it? Well, I reckon it's probably about the things you preached about right now. All right. You can back me up on it. Amen. John 14, 16. Jesus Christ speaking. And I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter. So Jesus Christ is the comforter on earth. Now he's going to give them another comforter. That he may abide with you how long? Forever. Forever. Look at verse 26. Or verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. The Comforter was there. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. And in John 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. That is what God says he would do. He would do. He says the comforter here, the first holy thing that God gives you for comfort is the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Ghost is said to be your comforter. Now that's only true if you're born again. Yep. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then the Holy Ghost has taken up residence inside of you. He lives inside of you. He is the, 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 the coming. The Lord Jesus Christ departed. The Holy Ghost is the coming of the way of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in his departure said that he would be leaving the world. He would leave the world behind, but knowing all things to come. That is that knowing all trials and tribulations and all sorrows, all things that were past, all things that were present, all things that are future, he knowing that, that, that things would still come into these disciples' lives and our lives, he knew that mankind needed a permanent residence and companion for comfort. He says, if I don't, if I don't go away, I cannot send the comfort to you. In other words, that the Lord Jesus Christ is resurrected, but that never had any ability to comfort you in that midst of His departing, that you're separated from God. And the Holy Ghost that God gave you is to keep you in Christ Jesus. It's to keep you in His grace and in His mercy and in His comfort. That is your lifeline. That is your connection. That is what gives you the ability to talk to God is the Holy Ghost. Some have taken the Holy Ghost and they've magnified it to the point where Christ can no longer be seen at all. But you know what's funny about the people that magnify the Holy Ghost, the Corinthian church there, they boast about their gifts and their signs and their tongues and their healings. And the Corinthian church did. And Paul says to the Corinthian church, What? Know ye not uh, that the Holy Ghost is inside of you? The church that bragged the most about having the Holy Ghost gifts didn't even know the Holy Ghost was inside of them. And if they're boasting about your gifts, if you don't even know the one that's inside of you giving you the gifts. In other words, you can know comfort, but unless you know the one giving you the comfort, what do you really know about God and His love and His comfort? You have the comfort of the Holy Ghost through the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are some places that God provides comfort? Well, number one, God provides comfort when you feel alone. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, that's you personally, forever. That is that when you feel alone, he's still with you. Amen. When you say, God, it's just me, there's nobody here. When there's no, when you feel like everybody's left you, and there's nobody to help you go through sorrow and grief, and there's no flowers, no cars, no phone calls, no, no, nothing's whatsoever. What's going on? 
And God's like, is that really what you want? A college of flowers? Hey. What do you want me? I want both. Well, how about you start with me? Those flowers are going to die. You can eat those chocolates. And all you've done is gain weight in your misery. <laughs> Amen. But he says, me, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hey. I started thinking about that. I thought about Elijah. Elijah's on the run from Ahab and Jezebel, and understandably so. Elijah is one of the greatest prophets, if not the greatest prophet in all the Bible. And yet he finds himself in the same place where you and I find ourselves. <clears throat> under the juniper tree, thinking all is lost. We call it juniper junction. Two roads like this. And you're like, one road I quit and die, and the other road I keep going. I don't know which way to go. You ever felt there? You ever got there? I felt like I can't, to go on, I, I can't, and to stop, I can't do that either. What do I do? And and, uh, and old Elijah gets into a cave, and he's hiding himself there, and he's wishing himself to die. And he says, everybody's forsaking me, uh, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, everybody's against me, and that was true. But God says, hey, Elijah, there are still 7,000 prophets that have not yet vowed the need of Baal. You're not alone. Amen. But he heard a, a, a big old whirlwind come by, a big old earthquake, a big old hurricane come by, and God wasn't in that. He saw the fire come by, and God wasn't in that. But then he heard a still, small voice. Amen. The Holy Ghost whispered to him and said, You ever get alone like that? You're sitting here you're thinking, everybody's against me. Nobody loves me. I don't see anything out there at all that's going to work to my good. And if you're saved, God's like, <laughs> you know what God didn't do? God didn't walk over. God now walk over to Elijah and say, hey, Elijah, you a big dummy, you a big quitter. God did not lay the hammer of guilt and judgment on him. Yeah. God did not take the knife that he could have and stuck it in the fifth rib. God did not come over there and rebuke him. He just said, Why do you think that God sometimes He knows where you're at? Yeah. God knows, like, all right, you've been through enough. I'm, I'm not going to lay it on too thick. Yeah. I'll wait for that. Yeah. But right now, I'm going to deal with you in a still small voice. Amen. Elijah, God provides comfort when you feel alone. How about Daniel and the lion's den? Yeah. You ever wonder about that? Gets thrown down, gets thrown down in a pit, a lion's pit there for having done everything right. He has disobeyed the church state religion. Yeah. You know, you pray, we're gonna kill you. That's the church state religion. Nebuchadnezzar never never could have never did figure that thing out. The very next thing he does is, anybody that does not worship God, we're gonna kill him. Yeah. That didn't work out so well for the first time. How about we just let people believe what they want to believe and leave it up to them? Amen. But nevertheless, Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. You know what he does? He prays, I'm sure. And God shuts the lion's mouth. Yeah. You know who was there with him in the lion's den? The Holy Ghost. Yeah. In fact, Daniel's one of the greatest types, if not the greatest type, of the Holy Ghost in the Bible. <clears throat> Secondly, God provides comfort for us by teaching us when we don't understand. Look at verse 26. <clears throat> but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. You know what the Holy Ghost does? He provides comfort. He teaches you when you don't understand what's going on. Yeah. He teaches you what he's doing. I think of uh, 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 Joshua after the Battle of Ai. Remember that there? They defeat the bat they defeat the the Jericoites, whatever they're called, and uh, the, all the walls come tumbling down, and it's a great victory, and it's a great, hey, power of God is with us. Remember that there? Yeah. Great conquest. Hey, AI, little city, two-letter word, no big deal. We got this. And God ain't telling nobody to go do anything. But they go, and they're defeated. I did the math one time. It's like 0.0003% of the nation of Israel died at the Battle of AI. You know where you find Joshua after that? <laughs> Balling out. He disobeyed God. He didn't do what he didn't do. He did what God did tell him to do. He got ahead of himself. Right. And on that time, God does lay it out on Joshua. He says, "Get up, 
Wherefore, wherefore liest thou on thy face? Well, there was still a small voice on that. Amen. But he still recognized the voice. He said, you got yourself into this mess. You get up. And what Joshua did, he got up. <laughs> he got up. Amen. He said, here's why you're in the trouble you're in. There's sin in the camp. Yeah. Joshua did not know why they just lost an Ai. Now it was not because they didn't seek the Lord's face. Because had they seen the Lord's face, he would have said, you can't go fight Ai until you get rid of Achan. Right. But Joshua didn't know about Achan until he went through the storm. Amen. Then in the midst of the storm, God taught him something. Amen. See, why am I going through a storm? To teach you something that you are not going to see otherwise, unless he puts you through it. And when God says, get up, you had better get up, get your clothes on like David said. Remember David said about that seven-day-year-old boy? He got up, he got dressed. He said, I'm not, he says, he'll not come to me, but I shall go to him. Amen. He walked, and they said, what is this? Seven days he fasted and wept and cried. Now that his son's dead, he's getting dressed because God taught him something. Amen. That is when God, when you're in the midst of a storm, and when God says, get up and go to church, that is the time to continue your pity party. It's time to go because God's got something to comfort you about mm -hmm. and to teach you about. I just don't feel like it. You felt? You think Joshua felt like it? I don't think he did. You think David really felt like it? But God taught him something in his trial. Are you teachable? If you are, he'll break storms. You got to be thankful for the storms. It means that God is trying to teach you something. Right. If you have no storms ever, it's God saying, I can't teach you nothing. You're on your own, bud. When you need me, I'll be here. Thirdly, God brings us inner peace when we are in trouble. Look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. The Holy Ghost brings us inner peace when we are in trouble. I think of Peter or Paul in prison. Peter and Paul were in prison were preaching the gospel. You know what they had there? They had great peace. The Bible says, uh, perfect peace or great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I gave up to Brother Jason the other day. He said, hey, I'm getting a lot of flack. I'm getting a lot of pushback. I, I'm in a storm against people that don't like my change and my behavior in my life. I said, that's wonderful. Amen. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. That your friends, your lost friends, or if they're safe. You know what he said? He said, he said, he said, Jeff. He said, people are starting to invite me to their churches yeah. that never invited me before. Yeah, that's right. yeah. mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, brother. I, I, should have worn, I had a shirt underneath the, the sweatshirt that said, uh, beware, uh, you are a you are a possible example in church. I wore that shirt, but I had to show it to you. Anything you say to you might be used against you in church. Okay? <laughs> but he said, he said, Jeff, he said, I, he said he had a woman invite him to church knowing him 15 years. And she invited him, I'm not going to tell you the church or the name, but invited him to church to have him give a public testimony of his salvation. Amen. They had time to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> I love my Peter back there. <laughs> amen, he's saved. But 15 years she's known him. She never invited him to church and never told him how to get saved. Yeah. Right. Now that he's saved, hey, come to my church and give a testimony. Yeah. You know what that is? That's a little bit of a storm on the horizon. Yes. That is people on the outskirts trying to drag you away. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah. That is that God's doing something with you. That means you're, I told us that you're getting on a hit list. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing to be on a hit list. Yeah. But you better understand when that stuff comes... You better get close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You better get close to the, listen to the Holy Ghost when He says, "Don't go or go." Amen. How do you know you're supposed to pack up and leave? The Holy Ghost told me. All right, you better make sure it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's a lot of folks out there that try to get you to do things out of the will of God. Amen. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. Say, what is that? It's peace. <laughs> uh, Rebecca and I are giving this uh, very carnal example. I don't have a better one on top of my head. When we, when we got married and we were, we were on, not to get married, we wanted to have a honeymoon, we didn't know what to do. And I remember driving, I think, to your house. We're coming up around the MSK exit there. And um, I'll tell you, some of the silliest things that the Lord does that just brings back memories that just, uh, it's good. And, uh, and I'm telling you, so silly, you're going to be like, that ain't a peaceful thing. It is. It marked a very intimate relationship between her and I and us and the Lord on how we can be like-minded. 
And we both looked at each other and said, how about we go to your family's home in Rehoboth Beach? They moved into yet. Yeah, that'll be our honeymoon. And it was in that agreement. We're not even in marriage yet. We knew each other not even six months yet. And we had this agreement. And it was just great inner peace. And that's where God wanted us on our honeymoon. Amen. And God used that for his honor, for his glory. And we've got a lot of things done there for the Lord and for our own selves. And just growing together like that. Great peace we had in that moment. What is that? It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's as simple as that. Or it's as dramatic as in the middle of this literal storm, God says, peace be still. Mm. I think of the three Hebrew trill children in the furnace. Who they said, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. We're not going to worship your God. He says, all right, in the fiery furnace you go. And sure enough, lo, there was one there like unto the Son of God. Amen. Amen. You're in the fiery furnace. You're not alone. Yeah. They had great peace in there. Why? And they have dinner on the grounds in there. They have a, bar they have a barbecue, and they weren't the main meal. Yeah. What a blessing. Not only that, but he, the Holy Ghost guides us in search of the truth in uncertain times. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 13. John 16, 13. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. What am I saying? I'm saying when you got the Holy Ghost, you got the one who's going to comfort you. And he comforts you as he guides you in search of truth during uncertain times. Folks, can I just say that America, since 2020 at least, is in uncertain times? Yeah. The Bible says that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I mean, we are in the last days. We are in perilous times, and we are in uncertain times. Not just in political arena, not just in the health arena, but in the spiritual arena, yeah. we are in uncertain times. Amen. The Bible says in the last days, uh, he says uh, a lot of times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We are in the most uncertain, most perilous, and louder times of the church age. Yep. Amen. And while you have all the stuff going all around you, which are storms that are brewing, it's like a storm here. It's a perfect storm. You've got a political storm, a spiritual storm, and a health storm all working together mm. to magnify it, to be that one great storm yeah. that will come become the great tribulation. But we right now are in that the eye of that perfect storm. How are you going to maintain? How are you going to hold fast? How are you going to continue? How are you going to deal with all that and then deal with financial problems? How are you going to deal with job loss? How are you going to deal with 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 a possible you know uh, defaulting on loans or mortgages? How are you going to know how to deal with car problems or or family problems? How are you going to know how to deal with anything? When they can't even deal with the health crisis that is in the world. Yeah. Forget the spiritual crisis that's in the world. They've been trying to figure that out since the garden. They can't figure that out. How are you supposed to figure your own personal problems within all the other stuff? There's only one way. Yeah. It's the comforter, hey. which is the Holy Ghost. He says he will guide you into all truth. God, I want to know how I'm supposed to live in light of the corona. Let me guide you. Let me show you. Be not afraid. I told you, not you can't cheat death. You can't eradicate death. There's no pill to take away the grief of loss and pain of death and sorrow. It ain't going to happen. So how do you navigate that truth in light of the 400, 500,000 that are dying around us? How do you navigate the Holy Ghost? It's the only thing I can tell you. That's right, yeah. The Holy Ghost will guide you and all. He'll let you know what to believe on every level, whether it be political or health, but spiritually, the spiritual truth. He'll guide you into it all. I think of Nicodemus. Nicodemus uh, was in a very uh, politically uh, via, uh, uh, hot time where you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is there. He's claiming to be the Messiah. And, uh, and, and the Jews at that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were, they were 
a church state kind of a thing. They were very close with uh, Pilate and the Caesars. They wanted to make sure they could practice their, their Judaism under Roman law. So they were very close in that. Remember, Pilate said, you know, he says, you know, okay, I'll observe your day. I'll give you a, a someone to be released. They found favor with Pilate. He let them observe their Jewish feasts and whatnot without being, you know, killed. And as long as it wasn't insurrection like Barabbas was. If you're an insurrectionist, you're dead. But if you live under our system, we'll let you practice your religion. Even in China, if you will, there's a guy down there, a missionary, uh, Brother Mills. He's in, he's in the education sector. And uh, Brother Mills, he's allowed to have a church. But he's very smart how he does it. He makes sure that he doesn't do anything that is going to bring reproach upon the name of China. Mm -hmm. And that allows them to be able to, them to be able to have a church and preach. He's good for business. He's good for China. In fact, he was one of them to help Steve get in to see the warehouses down there for manufacturing if he needed it. He's very closely tied in. Because he doesn't do anything that gets him kicked out. But he also doesn't compromise on the Bible either. Okay? Well, you've got to think about this. Jesus Christ is on earth at that time. He's claiming to be the Messiah. And he's preaching things that seem to contradict Moses' law. And Nicodemus is like, I'm either going to lose my... Because Nicodemus was a, was a spiritual man. And he was a, I think he was a, a Pharisee. And, and uh, he, he was working the law. Very smart educator. And uh, he was either going to lose his position in the college and the uh, education arena or both, and his political career if he were to listen to this man named Jesus. So what does God do? He meets one on one, and Nicodemus said, "You know, what Nicodemus, he's got questions. Ain't you got questions? What do you believe? What am I supposed to believe?" Nicodemus had questions, and God said, "He answered." Yeah. He says, "You know, why am I not saying to thee, you must be born again? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Why am I not saying you must be born again?" Nicodemus like, "How can a man enter his mother's womb a second time?" And God lays it out for him what he means by that. Nicodemus is there. At the burial of Jesus Christ with the, uh, what's his face there? Who was it? Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Now look at Nicodemus traded in his political career and his spiritual, in his, uh, you know, his uh, spiritual career, if you will, with the Jews for the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he get there? The Lord Jesus Christ guided him into all truth. Amen. You want to know the truth? The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. It's going to make you free. And he said, if you're free, then you're free indeed. Well, isn't it a blessing? Sometimes you want people to live in the fear that they live in. Yeah. Yeah. They might be saved, but they're not listening to the Holy Ghost, which is in them. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a while that you can watch the media if you choose to, watch the news if you choose to, or read books if you choose to, and see right through it? Yeah. Amen. What's giving you that discernment? The Holy Ghost. Yeah. The Holy Ghost. That's what. Right. Look at go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, sometimes you know what you're going to preach. Like I knew I was going to preach comfort. Sometimes you don't know how the Lord's going to let you preach it. I can't preach to you all four points of this sermon. This is just the first point. <laughs> and so I'm only going to preach the first point this morning and, um, and leave it there. But I want to give you the other three real quick. The other way that you're comforted is by the Holy Scriptures. Thirdly, the way that you're comforted is by the Holy Brethren with the Holy Kiss. And then lastly, you're comforted by the knowledge of that holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, how did you get to know the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Brethren and the holy uh, city named New Jerusalem? How did you come to know all that? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost guided you and led you into all truth. But for the purpose of this sermon this morning, I'm just going to preach on how the Holy Ghost is to be your comforter. Are you at Romans chapter 8, verse 27? Romans chapter 8, verse 27. We are comforted by the Holy Ghost when we feel alone, when we don't understand, when we are in trouble, when we are in uncertain times. And Romans 8, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts uh, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Lean back up to the verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Look at it. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself 
maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he, the Holy Spirit, searcheth the hearts, knoweth what the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I want to say, fifthly, that the Holy Ghost prays for us when we don't know how to pray. Amen. Sometimes you just don't know how to pray. You're in a storm. You're in uncertain times. You're in perilous times, troublous times. You're trying to search for answers. You're trying to search for the truth. And you just don't know how to pray. And God's like, yeah, I got that one too. Sometimes you know what to pray for. Lord, I got a big old giant hole in my shoe. <laughs> is there a deal on Jay-Z Pennies to get me some new shoes? Well, sure enough, there is. Glad you asked. Sometimes you know exactly what to pray for. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. You know what I was praying for? I prayed for a wife. That's okay, man. I, I knew what I was praying for. And God gave me one. But there's sometimes you do not know what to pray for. Especially when you are in great agony, in grief, in sorrow, and loss. You don't know how to pray. Like you can't even get to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in time of need. You can't even drag yourself there yeah. because you're just so overcome with grief. That's real, folks. Are you thankful that even when you can't get to the altar of God, the Holy Ghost ever lived to make intercession for Amen. us? Amen. That He prays for you. You don't know whether you're supposed to be thankful right now or angry right now. You don't know if you're supposed to pray for deliverance or pray that God keeps me innocent a little bit longer. You don't know how to pray oftentimes. <clears throat> I'll be honest, there's times in this church, when it comes to each and every one of you, I hit your name in my daily prayers, and I say, Lord, I don't know what, how, what or how to pray for. I've tried this, nothing. Tried that, nothing. I haven't tried the end around, the back the back around, the end of the end, the end of the end zone, the Hail Mary pass. I tried it all, Lord, and nothing hey. seems to work. I don't know how to pray. And yet the Lord says, it's all right, I got it. You know what I do? I just lift up your name in prayer and I move on to the next person. Amen. Because I know exactly what they ask for. A brand new car. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Not from this, brother. You oh, okay. Got up my salary, brother. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know how to pray. But the Holy Ghost knows exactly what you need when you need it. Amen. Sometimes you're like, Lord, I know you've got this thing in this person's life. And I don't dare pray that you bless them because I, you already are. So I just say, Lord, I really don't know what they need because those have got it all already. So, Lord, I'm just going to have to leave it to you because I don't know. Sometimes you just don't know how to pray. And yet the Holy Ghost inside of you, that great comforter, he prays for you. You know, I thought about when I thought about this, and I've kind of taken this, this sermon here and boiled it down to one point about the Holy Ghost and what he does for us, and then also parallel it to the Old Testament. You know, I thought about here when um, I thought about we don't know how to pray as we ought and the Holy Ghost. I thought of Jeremiah. I thought of old Jeremiah, the, yeah. the preacher. I told you this morning, sometimes you feel like Jeremiah. No matter what you say or how you preach, ain't nothing getting across the plate. Mm -hmm. Like the umpires call everything balls. And I know it's I know it's across the middle of the plate, man. It's, 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 it's here and here. Of course, they keep moving the strike zone, so I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> but I know where it's supposed to be. And it's across the center plate. And yet, it's being called a ball. What the world is going on? I don't know how to pray. That's how Jeremiah felt. He knew he was preaching God's word. And they weren't listening to it. Mm -hmm. And for his preaching, they cast him into the miry pit. Mm -hmm. You know what Jeremiah said when he was down there? I quit. This is the Jeff version. I quit. Yeah. I'm through and finished. I'm done. Pack up my bags. You know, put the, you know, burn the uh, the degrees. It's all over with. I'm out. I'm finished. Kaput. Feliz. Done. Out of here. See you later. Adios, amigos. How about it? Enjoy your Babylonian captivity. I'm gone. Yeah. You know what he said, Brother Dave? There was a fire burning with inside of him Amen. that he could not stay. Amen. Or forbear was the word he used. Could not forbear. He didn't know how to pray, but he knew he couldn't give up. Yeah, man. But he couldn't pray his way out of it. 
He couldn't pray his way out of it. You know who was there praying for him? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was down there where, where we all are sometimes, down that miry pit, wallowing in the filth and the mire and the muck of our own grief and sorrow yeah. and pain and doubt and confusion and anger and all that junk. And we don't know how to pray. We feel like all is lost. And the Holy Ghost is like, And we Father, Lord Jesus Christ, in, uh, in your name, uh, this guy here, he don't know how to pray, but Lord, you know I know how to pray to you, so uh, Lord, let's keep that a little bit longer. And then, hey, would you say Ebed Malek? With some old uh, claws and rags there. Hey, will you send that down to him? <laughs> Sometimes you're down the pit that way and you see no way out. How are you supposed to pray? You see no way out. Jeremiah could not scrape his way up or dig his way down, out and out from there. Paul and Silas, they couldn't get themselves out of prison. All they could do was rejoice and praise God until they broke the chains free. You know who was there praying? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was praying. I'm thankful the Holy Ghost prays for us, but we don't know how to pray. And we don't know how to pray for others. And lastly, let me just say this. We'll go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Yeah. Psalm 23, a very famous psalm. And that after this point, you come on up. But Psalm 23, look at verse 4. Psalm 23, verse 4. Say, Pastor, what do I do if I don't know how to pray? And I know the Holy Ghost is praying for me. Just continue where you're at. Just stay put. Stay where you're at. Jeremiah stayed put because he could go nowhere else. Just stay put where you're at. God will either keep you there until he gets you out, or God will deliver you immediately. But if you don't know what to do, do nothing. I let the Holy Ghost pray for you and lead you and guide you until it's time to see the light. But look at Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Yeah. That's how we started our sermon. Death passed upon all men. It's going to come eventually to all of us in some age, some time. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For that, God, the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, for thou art with me. He was there in the pit. He was there in the prison. Uh, he was there in the palaces. Uh, he's there in the fiery furnace. He's there all the time, everywhere you go. Man. He is there. He's with you. Man. Not only that, not only is he with you, but look. Thy rod and thy staff, they what? Even as you fix the cross, the river Jordan, in death, even in our very hour of death, the promise is, Thou art with me. You and I could not cross the river Jordan alone. Remember Ezekiel over there? He wanted to go to the river. He said he got into that river there. He got off the river bank side and it was ankle deep. And then it was knee deep. And then it was waist deep. And then he said it was to a point where I could not pass. You cannot pass the river of death alone. Mm -hmm. And who takes you from this life to the next? Amen. The Holy Ghost does. He takes you over. He, like, he brings it through as if you're walking on dry ground. Remember when the seas parted there with Moses? Mm -hmm. Moses saw no way across the Red Sea there. That's like death. You see no way of getting across in death. That is a very fearful thing. It's sorrow, it's grief, the loss of life is hard. I don't care what age it is, it's hard. And you see no way to get through it or no way to overcome it. And the Holy Ghost says, that's why God sent me. That's why I saved you. That's why I left you, I departed. In my death, I departed, I'm giving you the Holy Ghost. So when you depart, there, you can be with me also. But you get there through the Holy Ghost. He says the rod. The rod is used for correction. This is the rod. This is the thing that corrects you. But he says it's not only a rod, but it's a staff. Amen. The very same thing that corrects you and instructs you is also the very thing that guides you and comforts you Amen. into a present situation. Whatever it is now, whatever it was yesterday, or whatever it will be in the future, 
as she quoted the other day, Jesus Christ is saved yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. He's been there since the Garden of Eden when he says, My, Thy seed and her seed. He was there at the loss of life for Eve, and he'll be there for you at the loss of your life or the loss of a life that's dear, dear, and dear to you. The same yesterday, today, and forever till he comes. Amen. One day he's going to catch us up out of this world and take us to that holy city, New Jerusalem, where it dwells righteousness. And he says there, there's no sorrow, no death, no pain, no grief. The curse is lifted. Amen. It's eternal comfort and joy in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're saved. That is that the storms you face now and the grief and the torment you face now is temporary compared to the eternal comfort in glory. Whereas for the unsaved, the comfort they face now is temporary compared to the eternal torment they will face. Remember in Luke 16? He says to the rich man, in your life, you fared, you, you fared sumptuously, you had everything you ever needed. But in death, he says, uh, Lazarus is comforted and you're tormented. This life is not a place to get eternal comfort. That one up there is. That's right. It's temporary for us compared to eternity. Yeah. For the unsaved, it's temporary comfort now, eternal torment forever. I pray you're saved. Have the Holy Ghost see you this morning. I pray his message helps you. Then I want to close with a song and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I pray you to bless the message, Lord. I pray, God, that in only the way that you can, that you would uh, comfort our hearts and, Lord, uh, touch our hearts, Lord. No doubt somebody here today is dealing with needing some comfort. Lord, there might be somebody here today that feels alone, that feels like they're on an island, that has nobody there with them to uh, occupy their time or be their friend or companion. I'm so thankful that you promised to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you said that greater love had no man than this, and the land, man laid down his life for his friend, and you certainly did that for us. So while we feel alone, Lord, it's good to know that we have you as a friend always with us. God, there's somebody here this morning that, uh, Lord, just is uncertain or is in doubt. Uh, Lord, we pray that you lift them up, Lord, and show them and teach them. Pray, God, you, you would guide them in all truth as you promised that you would. Lord, if there's anybody here that feels tempted uh, to leave uh, the good paths, Lord, and go to the old paths, God, I pray that you would, through the Holy Ghost, speak to them as you spoke to the prophets of old to keep them in the right and the good paths. Uh, Lord, is anybody that is just, uh, Lord, just doesn't know how to pray or what to do, God, I pray Lord, that you remind them that you are there praying uh, for them. And Lord, I pray also for anybody in the storm now, that God, that you deliver them from it in due time. And God, as they look back, they might be able to see just what all you brought them through, Lord. How good it is, God, to be saved and to know that you're there with us through it all. We love you and we thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and say one number, Dad. 313.